The system rubbing it in your face as they have many times. We'll talk about airlines. Why are they dangerous? Why are they unpleasant? We have a wonderful light in the mood that'll put a smile on your face. All that's coming up on I'm Right. I want you to picture something as we get into the Ray Epps stuff and the system stuff. I'll get to that in a moment, but let me ask you a question, really. Put something to you. Picture this. I want you to picture you have a home, an apartment, wherever you live. And I, I watch your home and I wait until you're gone. I wait for you to take off for work or take off to run errands and I make sure you're gone. And then I sneak over your back fence and I low crawl up to your door and I pick the lock and I go inside of your home and I steal lots of your stuff. All right, so you had that scenario, right? I broke in while you were gone. I stole lots of your stuff. I left. You come home. Oh my gosh, my stuff is gone. That's really bad. That's one scenario. Scenario two is this. Your home. You hear a knock at the door. You open up the door. It's me. I say hi. And I walk right past you as you open up the door. I walk in right in front of you and just start grabbing your stuff, stuffing it in a bag, and then I walk right past you on the way out the door, hop in my car, and I drive home. Of those two scenarios, which one is actually more frightening? It's the second one, isn't it? The story of today is Ray Epps and the deal he got. Ray Epps, we'll play the video, you've seen it a thousand times, we'll play it in a minute, but Ray Epps, the guy who's on camera, looking like he's doing a whole lot of things that other people have gone to prison for. Remember, somebody, one of the January 6th political prisoners, is currently doing 22 years. He never stepped foot in the Capitol building. 22 years. Ray Epps doing all these things on camera, gets a sweetheart deal today, probation, little community service, nothing, not even any jail time. And people are outraged today about the sweetheart deal, and that's perfectly reasonable to be outraged today about the sweetheart deal. I hope you're outraged about it. But that's not, that's not the scariest thing about the Ray Epps deal today. The scariest thing about it is the system. The system knows that you know. They know. They pay attention to this show. They pay attention to the writing people do. They pay attention to radio. They pay attention to the things you are saying on, on social media and otherwise. The system knows that you know about Ray Epps. And they know that you know, and they still gave him this cherry little deal. Not behind closed doors, not in the dark. They didn't sentence him to 10 years and then you know quietly parole him five months from now. Hey, we gotta placate the commoners. They rubbed it right in your stinking face. Hey, here's a guy you know we should send to prison, and we're not. This is a very dangerous place to be as a country because the evil, corrupt people who run the country, it's not just that they're evil and corrupt, it's that now they don't feel like they have to hide it anymore. What does that mean for us as a nation? I don't know exactly, but it's not good. This human being is getting off without any jail time? We need to go into the Capitol! Into the Capitol! Peacefully! Fed! 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 Peacefully! Okay, folks, grab the word. As soon as the president starts speaking, we go to the Capitol. The Capitol is this direction. Don't you want to know exactly what he whispered in that guy's ear at the end, right before that guy breaks down the barricades? Anyway, joining me now, 
the great Julie Kelly, obviously. I'm sure you're already on her substack called Declassified. If not, you should be. Julie, okay, look, knock me over with a feather. What am I supposed to act shocked today? Ray Epps get, gets off essentially scot-free, probation. And like I've been telling people, Julie, they want you to know. They want you to know that they don't have to obey the law, and you do. This is part of what these people do. This is how evil they are. That is exactly it. They are not even trying to conceal the fact that Ray Epps has been treated so differently, not just by the DOJ, but by the corporate media, who considers everyone at the Capitol on January 6th an insurrectionist, a domestic terrorist, except somehow Ray Epps emerges as a sympathetic figure. So not only was he treated differently, he got a slap on the wrist charge when he should be facing multiple serious charges, including obstruction of an official proceeding, interfering with law enforcement. He gets one trespassing, disorderly conduct trespassing charge. Not only that, he didn't even have to show up in the courtroom today for his sentencing. He's been nowhere near Washington, D.C. So unlike most January 6th defendants who have to travel to D.C., go before a judge, get a tongue lashing by the judge in person in front of their family for being an insurrectionist, Ray Epps got to phone it in today, 12 months probation, a small fine, some community service, a very unusual case, charges, and very unusual sentence. Julie, for those people who aren't quite aware of your reporting, maybe this is their first time reading you or watching my show here, would you please elaborate on the kind of court system Ray Epps just got this sweetheart deal in? Is this the kind of court system that's been treating people on the right really kindly for the last three years? Well, let me just say no. Um, there's a reason why the Department of Justice has a nearly 100% conviction rate. Actually, they do have a 100% conviction rate. Not a single January 6th defendant facing D.C. juries, of course, 100% basically Democrat city, after nearly two years of jury trials, not a single January 6th defendant has been fully acquitted by a jury. This is two years into this prosecution and trials. Now, jurors have dropped a few charges. They have acquitted some defendants on charges, but not one has been fully acquitted. This is out, unheard of. Compare that to what happened in the Whitmer Fednapping hoax. Those trials took place in Michigan, not Washington, D.C. Half of those defendants who went to trial were found not guilty and acquitted by juries. So this is, I call it the legal and judicial circle of hell. There's no way to escape it. These judges will not move these trials out of Washington. But all of a sudden now you have the hero to the left, Ray Epps, slap on the wrist, never shows up, probation, and he'll just go on with his life doing whatever he was doing before, which is still under question. Julie, people who read you are well acquainted with the name Matthew Graves. People who don't probably don't know who that is. Anyway, here was Matthew Graves a few days ago. We have used our prosecutorial discretion to primarily focus on those who entered the building, are those who engage in violent or corrupt conduct on Capitol grounds. But if a person knowingly entered the restricted area without authorization, they had already committed a federal crime. Make no mistake, thousands of people occupied an area that they were not authorized to be present in in the first place. Julie, before we get into what he's saying there, would you do just a brief little background, not only on Mr. Matthew Graves and what he's been doing the last three years, but on his lovely wife? Yes, yeah, so that's Matthew Graves, a Biden campaign advisor who was appointed by Biden at the end of 2021 to take over the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. He then accelerated the criminal prosecution. Uh, brought seditious conspiracy charges, et cetera. And there he is in really an egregious, brazenly political performance over an hour speaking at the Department of Justice, rehashing all of the January 6th information. A lot of it we already heard from the committee and saw. Furthermore, Matthew Graves' wife, the team of Goss Graves, runs a very influential $100 million nonprofit in Washington, D.C., very radical organization, abortion on demand, trans rights, et cetera, uh, everything that the left loves. There she is. 
Now, it's okay. I mean, it's like Washington. Okay, so she runs a left-wing nonprofit. Her husband's a prosecutor. It's the swamp, blah, blah, blah. Except that Fatima Goss Graves, according to my reporting and research, has visited the Biden White House at least three dozen times since her husband was appointed, not just U.S. attorney, but put in charge of this uh, retaliatory, abusive criminal prosecution of Donald Trump. So, you know, it must be nice to be the Graveses. You can engage in all of this political act activism, use your post as Matthew Graves is to bolster Joe Biden's uh, reelection launch that he uh, underwent last week on the events of January 6th. And here's Matthew Graves, not just helping him politically, but keep in mind, Jesse, you're talking to a potential jury pool in Donald Trump's trial. How this is not an instance of jury tampering now, 60 days out, less than 60 from the trial date, which will probably be moved. But nonetheless, this was so egregiously political, uh, interfering in an ongoing criminal case and trial against former president. Um, but, you know, no consequences for him or his wife or anyone else. They always get away with it. Just a little one sentence recap for everybody there. The Biden campaign advisor was then made into a U.S. attorney where he used that position to throw Joe Biden's political opponents in prison for three years, all while his wife was visiting the White House dozens of times. Are you fully aware of how corrupt and evil your government is yet? Okay, Julie, speaking of corrupt and evil, Trump had an immunity appeal today. What's an immunity appeal? What is this? How did it go? So this was Donald Trump's motion to dismiss the January 6th case filed by special counsel Jack Smith under immunity claims. In December, Judge Chutkin, another Obama appointee, claimed in a landmark opinion that uh, presidents are subjected to criminal prosecution. Trump then, of course, appealed that decision. Jack Smith, as you recall, quickly went over to the Supreme Court, tried to subvert the appellate process, get the Supreme Court to weigh in immediately. They tossed that request out in the garbage. So today was the appellate court, uh, appellate panel court hearing on Trump's appeal of Judge Chutkin's order. Two Democrat appointed, Biden appointed judges on the appellate court, one from George W. Bush. Um, and I have a tweet up about Judge Florence Pan. Uh, speaking of spouses, Judge Florence Pan, who was on this panel today, very clearly is prepared to uphold Judge Chutkin's immunity order. She is married to Max Steyer, a longtime Democrat Party activist who was one of Brett Kavanaugh's chief antagonists and uh, remains so. So, you know, it's just one big happy family. We're just not in it. Okay, you mentioned earlier in passing that Trump's court date would be moved in D.C., which prompts the question, is that good? Is it bad? Move to win? Is this a win? For, what is this? So they really need to settle the immunity issue before they can move forward. All of the pretrial deadlines have been put on hold. This includes jury selection, uh, what's called in limine motions, where both sides file what witnesses they want to call, you know, what, what their arguments are going to be on either side. All of that has been put on hold pending the settlement of the immunity issue. So, so far, the trial date is still scheduled for March 4th. It's inconceivable that that can move forward, even if the immunity matter is settled quickly at the appellate court and the Supreme Court, uh, you still have all of these deadlines that everyone needs to catch up on. That being said, Jesse, it's important that Jack Smith, the DOJ, and Judge Chutkin will not abide by any campaign timelines. If they have to put Donald Trump on trial in October of this year, they will do it. They don't abide by any norms, uh, any standards by the Department of Justice, certainly any political expectations of the people of this country that you're not going to put, you know, the Republican nominee for president uh, on trial in Washington, D.C., you know, while people are voting. I'm telling you, they won't care. As, as soon as this immunity issue is resolved and it's in DOJ's favor, they will move forward with prosecuting Donald Trump in Washington. And then don't forget the classified documents case trial also scheduled to start in May in Southern Florida. Yeah, what a friggin' mess this year is gonna be. Julie, appreciate you as always, you are the best, yeah. All right, well, you know, we talked about that spending deal Republicans are cutting yesterday. As you can imagine, 
Our friendship Roy is a little bit steamed about the whole thing, to put it mildly, and we're going to talk to him about that. But all that may have made you uncomfortable, but I am right. You know what probably steams you? When you call your timeshare company up and you tell them, hey, we'd like to come out, and they tell you, oh, sorry, all booked up again this year. By the way, pay your annual fees. They've doubled. I know you're frustrated. I know you want out of your timeshare, and I know you don't think you can get out because that's what they tell everybody. Sorry, you signed the contract. You're in it for life. This is a lie. This is a lie Lone Star Transfer has been exposing for a long time now. How long? Oh, I don't know. Over 18 thousand timeshare owners have been legally and permanently set free from their timeshare forever because of Lone Star Transfer. This is a family business. You are not stuck in your timeshare. You're simply a phone call away from finally being free. Does that sound appealing to you? Call them 844-310-2646 and let them set you free. All right? We'll be back. Congressional leaders have reached a top-line agreement for government funding for the 2024 fiscal year. When we began our negotiations, our goal was to preserve a non-defense funding level of $772 billion, the same level agreed to in our debt ceiling deal last June. And that $772 billion was precisely the number we reached. Not a nickel, not a nickel was cut. Man, it's one thing to lose a negotiation. It's another thing to have the people who just whipped you in the negotiation rub your face in it in front of the American people, the Republicans, the Republican leadership in the House. They started hammering away at those Democrats. And after a long negotiation, not a single dime got cut. Joining me now, somebody who is none too pleased about it, just like you are, the great Congressman Chip Roy of the state of Texas. Okay, Chip, well, wow, that was some pretty incredible negotiating. They negotiated everything the Democrats wanted without cutting a dime. Hooray, GOP. Oh, no, you, Chuck Schumer said they didn't cut a nickel. They didn't cut a ah, nickel, yes. Jesse. Uh, yes. Look, um, I can't actually put it into words, uh, just so everybody understands. Uh, I didn't love the debt deal last summer, right? It was pretty well do well documented. I thought we should have gotten more out of it for a four trillion dollar increase in the debt. I thought we should have done more to stop the Inflation Reduction Act, stop a bunch of bad policies and the woke agenda. Uh, but at the end of the day, we at least got some caps put in place, okay? And literally, all Speaker Johnson and all Republican leadership had to do is nothing but a continuing resolution funding government the rest of the year. And we would have ended up at about 1.564 trillion, which is a hundred billion dollars less than the deal that was just cut and was just being trumpeted on the floor by Chuck Schumer. If this is winning, then count me out. That's not winning. I mean, look, Jesse, this actually matters because last year when we had the speakers fight, we fought hard to get changes, substantive changes, try to change the process. And it was actually kind of working, not perfect, not to the level you or I would prefer, but we got a good border bill passed. We got limit save grow, which actually had a limit increase in the debt with actual substantive transformative changes in spending. We got caps put in place, not as far as I wanted to go. We got a good debt, uh, I'm sorry, a national defense bill that had good changes to all of the garbage. It was mission focused. And now we get in December, what do we do? We pass a water down to, uh, debt uh, defense bill with FISA extension. And now we're gonna do a funding bill that is funded at the level the Democrats are championing. And they're championing it because it's spending at the level of the Nancy Pelosi omnibus spending level that Republicans campaigned against. So now they can get all mad at me as much as they want about my speeches saying, name one thing that we've done, but we still haven't done one thing. Yeah, no, look, there's been nothing. And this is a year, obviously, where we want a motivated GOP to get out and vote. There's a lot more at stake than just the presidency. We have the House, we have the Senate, we have all these things. And these people in leadership, it's more than just Mike Johnson, these people in leadership, do they grasp at all, Chip, that every time they do one of these, all they do is kick sand in the face of their base and demotivate them? No, I'm not going to do it, Chip, but I'll tell you, as soon as I heard about this, I had yet another moment where I said, I'm not even voting in 2024. Screw these people. You know, and the thing is, you and I all know the importance of what we need to do for our kids and grandkids. We've got to show up and vote. 
but you are right. It does demoralize people. And and look, you know what the problem is? I was just asked about this on a friend of mine's show uh, here in Iowa. And, and so well, what's the problem? Why does this happen? And the answer that the best answer I could give is literally most of the Republicans I know, most of my colleagues, they run for the right reasons. They run for the reasons you and I believe in for the most part. Good people, generally God-fearing people. Uh, but what happens is they get to Washington and they never met an excuse they wouldn't embrace. And they never met a criticism they wouldn't cower from, right? Like you served in the military. All of those 400,000 tombstones sitting over Arlington National Cemetery, every veteran listening to your show, you guys faced bullets. You guys faced the prospect of death. You signed up to possibly give the last full measure of devotion for a country. And all politicians get are freaking tweets. People say mean things. You might lose an election. Who gives a crap? Like literally, if I lose an election and I have to go back to Texas and not go to Washington, D.C., that's kind of a win. The question here is, is what are we going to do with the time God gave us on this planet and in office? And Republicans, unfortunately, run away from the fight rather than running into the fight for the American people. That's a problem. Can you explain, uh, he's, I understand he's a friend and I understand you're not afraid to criticize the GOP. I'm not saying that, but I'm not gonna ask you to criticize a friend on camera, but Mike Johnson. Now I've had Mike Johnson on the show before prior to being speaker. I don't have any politicians hardly on the show. You're one of like five I'll even have on here. Mike Johnson has an outstanding voting record. Mike Johnson, I have always known him to be a principled human being and what happens when you walk into the speaker's office, Chip? Do they just remove your head and replace it with something else? I don't know who this guy is, but this isn't the Mike Johnson I've known. Well, look, again, you said it. Mike is a friend. He's an honest guy. Uh, but this is a time for us to speak truth to the American people. We don't have any more time to hope. We don't have any more time to wait around to win the House and win the Senate, only to have these same Republicans next year tell me, but Chip, we don't have 60 votes in the Senate. Because you and I both know that's what's coming at us, right? They always have an excuse. And and look, there were glimmers of signs that I did not like. Speaker Johnson, when he was a, a rank and file member, uh, you know, he supported bills out of the NDAA that would draft our daughters. You and I talked about this. That's garbage. There were signs of things that I didn't like. But at the end of the day, I was still hopeful that we would have a fight here. Um, look, I'm going to keep pushing on them. I hope that we'll wake up before they cut this deal in full. We still haven't got it done yet. Uh, I'm going to work with my Freedom Caucus colleagues to push back. But look, this is just more of the same. And look, I got to be honest with you. If this name, if the speaker's name was McCarthy instead of Johnson, there would 100% be a motion to vacate being thrown down on the table right now in this deal. But unfortunately, a few of my colleagues kind of shot that in September. So now here we are. Look, the bottom line is the American people. I'm out in Iowa. I'm campaigning for my, my friend Ron DeSantis. And we're out here. The people out here, they want to change. They thank me. They thank my friend Thomas Massey, who was out on the campaign trail with me, saying thank you guys for standing up and fighting for us and for our way of life. They're tired of more of the same out of Washington. They want leadership. They don't want excuses. And they want us to actually get the job done. So I'm going to keep pushing. Chip, uh, corruption and incompetence are not exactly breaking news after three years of this administration. But the defense secretary being hospitalized, his backup being on vacation and not being told that she now assumes his duties has to be one of the more bizarre stories I remember in the last three, the last three years. And it's so bizarre, it, it smells like corruption to me. And I'm not saying it is, but there is no way we really put the defense secretary in a hospital and nobody knew. Yeah, I mean, again, you wore the uniform. Um, I did not serve in the military. I, I got to believe that it really galls you, right? I mean, we're su we're supposed to, in this country, have civilian leadership for a reason. When you've got the civilian secretary of defense who goes MIA, the president doesn't know it, and his number two doesn't know it. Look, I promise you, if this were Republicans, our, our, you know, the media would be roasting us on fire. And, you know, look, I, I'll at least give them some credit. I mean, they're at least highlighting, you know, this occurred. They're not hiding it. But it's hard to hide. It's so absolutely abhorrent. But here's what bothers me more, Jesse. We Republicans, we're going to give the Defense Department another $28 billion increase in spending. We just gave them a national defense authorization that authorizes a lot of the garbage woke stuff that's going on over in the Pentagon. We Republicans feed the beast. You can't complain about it. If you fund it, you own it. And I don't think my Republican colleagues understand that. We own the mess. We own the incompetence. 
We own the purposeful destruction of the military to turn it into a woke social engineering experiment because we fund it. Uh, you're in Iowa. You're campaigning for Ron. You're campaigning out there for Ron DeSantis. What are his chances? What do you like? Look, I think he is moving in the right direction. Uh, look, President Trump has his has a, a block of the electorate that are 100 percent loyal to him. Uh, you got a media that isn't helpful. Uh, the media doesn't like Ron DeSantis because, frankly, the guy is delivered. He is delivered at every level in Florida, whether you're talking about taking on Anthony Fauci, when President Trump instead gave him a commendation on the way out of office after shutting down the greatest economy in the history of the world, forcing vaccines and mandates on people, and mass mandates and shutting down schools. Governor DeSantis was a beacon of hope. He opened his economy up. People moved to Florida. That's the kind of leadership we want. I want a guy that sent a plane uh, load of illegal aliens to Martha's Vineyard helping us actually save the election when Republicans were on their heels. That's leadership. And everybody said, you can't do that, you'll lose. You know what? He won by a million and a half votes and he won 62% of Hispanic voters. That's what leadership will yield. The American people want that. They're tired of the excuses. And with all due respect to former President Trump, who both you and I uh, supported in 16 and in 20, I will say that after I supported Ted Cruz in 2016, uh, President Trump did a lot of good things. But let's be clear. He came in and he cut a deal with Paul Ryan uh, on, uh, you know, a, a, a weak uh, Obamacare repeal. So we didn't get it repealed. We failed. We promised to repeal it. We didn't do it. Uh, we got a deal that he tried to cut with Paul Ryan on amnesty. We didn't get border uh, security legislation passed because he embraced a two million plus amnesty provision. He said he would sign a executive order uh, with respect to birthright citizenship. He didn't do it. That never got done. Um, these are the kinds of things that the American people are frustrated about, and yet some are blinded, and they say, oh, i got to support President Trump. Here on the ground in Iowa, people are seeing it. They're seeing the truth. Thomas Massey, the governor, and I, we're out on the stump. People are reacting. They want someone they can look up to in the White House because of who he is and what he's done, and that's working. And we're going up. Nikki Haley is cratering because she's an empty suit who, who goes out to New Hampshire and says, oh, yeah, you don't need to, you know, you, know, you need to correct the record of whatever Iowa does. That's not selling very well here. And so uh, we're trending in the right direction. Nikki Haley's plummeting and I think President Trump is stagnating. And so hopefully we'll have a really good day next Monday. Chip, you are the man, my man. I appreciate you very much. All right. We have uh, airplane doors blowing off. Why? Why does everything around us kind of feel like it's rotting? Quality, customer service, what's happening? Let's talk about this thing we all feel but can't really name in just a moment before we do that. Well, look, we just had the talk with Chip about it. <laughs> I don't want, I hate to even say what I'm about to say, but it's the truth. Even if 2024 is this huge win for Republicans, which I am hoping for, you are hoping for, I know how you're gonna go vote in November, even if it is. It's not going to stop inflation. It's not going to stop the spending. They're not even pretending to want to stop it. So what are normal people supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? What am I supposed to do when you won't stop destroying the value of my money? All I can do is protect myself. The only way to do that is precious metals. It's the only thing these people can't destroy the value of. They're powerless to do so, no matter what they do. Thousands of years, gold, silver have had incredible value. Thousands of years in the future, long after you're dead and gone, it will have value. Call Oxford Gold Group and get some delivered to your home. Even if you don't end up needing it, maybe your children will, or their children after them. Someone will need it. 833-995-GOLD or go to oxfordgoldgroup.com slash free. Protect yourself. We'll be back. Our diversity is our strength and our unity is our power as a nation. Hi, I'm Major Rachel Jones and what pride means to me is celebrating that diversity is our strength as a nation and as an army. We believe our diversity, our differences when joined together by a common set of ideals makes us stronger. Who we are as Americans embodying the simple truth that our diversity, our diversity is the strength of this nation. Yeah, except diversity is the weakness of this nation. Let's talk about this. Because I know you feel it. I know you see it. 
It's not just a getting older thing. Back in my day, it's, it's not that. It doesn't matter if you're 10 years old watching this or 90 years old watching this. You can feel something around you, can't you? You can feel the degradation of things around you. Maybe it's a customer service experience on the phone, calling to uh, try to get cable hooked up. Maybe you're purchasing a new car. Maybe you've had to deal with doctors, nurses, lawyers. Maybe you've had to deal with flying recently. But you feel it around you, don't you? You feel like society itself has gone down a few notches. Everything around you, the quality, the customer service. Well, that's because it has. And there's a reason it has. The quality of everything has gone down around you because of diversity. Understand that? It's because of diversity. You see, diversity itself is a ridiculous concept. You either have a society that is merit-based or diversity-based, but you cannot, under any circumstances, marry those two things. They are as separate. They will always be separate as oil and water. And it's not just a left-wing thing. Obviously, it came from them. But the GOP has fully embraced this concept as well. Kevin McCarthy just recently retired from Congress. And what did he brag about in his retirement video? He bragged about all the women and minorities he brought into the GOP. The GOP who sells you out and fails you every single day, its main bragging point is that there are more women and black people in there. Diversity is not our strength, it's our death as a nation. I call it, I've always called it and will call it, the death of everything. If I open up a burger shop and you open up a burger shop across the street, and in my burger shop, I make sure I want to have I want to make sure I have a white person and then a black person, and then we have to have enough women, and then we have to have enough transsexuals. And you, you just hire the best burger makers, no matter what their skin color, no matter what their gender is. Your burger shop will produce superior burgers. My burger shop will go downhill, 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 and downhill until it is eventually out of business, unless of course it gets a government subsidy for being so diverse. America's focus on diversity, left and right, is killing this nation. And I'll tell you what, it's not only killing the nation, it has already killed people, many of them in various fields. People have died because of diversity. And you saw what recently happened on this Alaskan Airlines flight. This is only the beginning. I've had pilots, we'll talk to Kay Smythe about this, I've had pilots email me and tell me, Jesse, I'm retiring, I'm aged out. I see the new crop of diversity hire pilots coming in. I won't fly with my family when I retire. People will die because of diversity. It's not our strength, it's a killer. It's killing everything in society around you. And it's pathetic that the other major party doesn't have the stones to talk like that. That's what diversity is. Diversity is our weakness. Now, let's talk about something. This is critically important. Critically important. You see, you need to subscribe to the podcast channel. Quit. The First TV has a podcast channel. TheFirstTV.com slash podcast. Do you like this show? Obviously, you don't have to ask. I know you love this show. Who wouldn't? You love the show. You love all the shows, the specials, the everything. Well, you don't have to go searching through your phone for them every single day. Just go subscribe to the podcast, thefirsttv.com slash podcast. Get every single one every day. It's all you need. All right? Let's talk to Kay. Next. Nothing like a gentle breeze when you're flying and a little fresh air in the cockpit. Anyway, why is there a big hole in the side of that brand new jet? Joining me now, social decline and apocalypse right here for the great Daily Caller, my friend Kay Smythe. Okay, Kay, uh, looked a little breezy in there. What, what happened? 
So it was a plug on the door that's or on the door frame that's supposed to hold in something to do with like one of those door window panels, you know, I think it was, uh, I don't think it was an emergency exit. I think it was literally one of the door and window panels over the wing. Um, it was faulty. They knew it was faulty. There was a pressurization light issue warning thingy thing. I don't know. That's a technical term. Um, mm -hmm. that was going off on the plane. I think it went off three or four times to the point that I'm not sure if it was Alaska or if it was um, the NTSB or whatever, decided to not do long haul flights on the aircraft because they were so concerned about this issue. But they thought, oh, it's fine. We'll just like take off and fly over land because there's not going to be any issues if a plane crashes over land. It will only be bad if it crashes over water. Like, it was a huge technical error and they've had to ground something like 170 aircraft over this. Like, th does that not terrify you, Jesse? Does that not terrify you? Okay, I'll be honest with you. That video is actually the second most terrifying thing that I've experienced when it comes to air travel. I've had not one, but multiple emails to my show from pilots who say they're about to retire, and when they do, they will not fly with their families on any one of the American airlines, well, not just American, Alaska, you know what I mean, because of the focus on DEI hiring and the, the passes these people are getting in the cockpit. When I have pilots, Delta pilots, United pilots, and others telling me they're not going to fly anymore, K, okay, that concerns me quite a bit. I can completely understand and appreciate why that would concern you. I mean, it's the same reason that most of our major services, I think, are collapsing at this point. When you prioritize people based on superficial attributes versus their actual skill set, things are going to go wrong. Like, I'm, uh, I'm an immigrant and I'm a woman. That doesn't mean that I should be allowed to get a pass at any job if there is someone more qualified than me like that that's not how you actually grow as a society and i actually worked with uh, a de and i company uh, long before i got back into media um sort of uh, 2018 2019 and i think it was my first day on the job i sat down and i said to the owners of this company i was like well the the position that you're going to put businesses in um, and the sort of messaging that you're pushing through DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, is actually going to perpetuate a lot of the negative stereotypes that you're trying to combat. And pretty much the way that everyone is going about DEI is like insanely racist. And it doesn't work to solve any of the problems that it sets out to solve. And as you said, it's literally putting hundreds of thousands of lives in danger every time people decide to get on a plane and fly over the country every year. Like yeah, that is that, terrifying. There will be deaths from DEI, there will. There, of course there will. And I mean, like, like you said, it should actually be more difficult for you to get a job as a woman. If we want to get this economy <laughs> back on track, that's the way we should go. Okay, speaking of women, Kay, you're from Wales, which I don't know, is in Africa or something, but I notice whenever I fly internationally, the stewardesses are not only lovely, not just lovely physically, they're lovely personality-wise. They just treat everybody, everyone around you, like a king. And then I fly domestically here in America, and almost universally on every flight, I'm treated like some kind of cold sore by the dudes and hags who work in American airlines. Why is it so different overseas and such garbage here? I think overseas, I will say there is as much as I don't like a lot of the things that go on in Europe and the UK, I don't like socialism, don't like the taxes, don't like the politics, etc. There is something within European culture, maybe it has to do with the age, maybe it has to do with um, just the way that we were raised, uh, mostly without sort of like phones and screens, like even to this day, it's just not as much of a problem in Europe for young people. But we also don't have the same sort of like sense of entitlement that I see so many people in sort of my age demographic out here in the United States have that sort of like normalization of I want, therefore I should get. Um, and that's where sort of common courtesy goes out the window. Obviously, I think a lot of the COVID lockdown stuff uh, really hurt the sort of social, emotional upbringing of a lot of Americans. And then I also kind of look at, you know, the generation that came before me 
that has kids sort of, you know, the general, the generation below me uh, and the one below that. And they just let their kids get away with anything and everything they want. And I, it used to be when I used to fly out to the States, Jesse, I'm talking like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I had the most incredible experience. I never had a problem. I would, I was blown away by how nice and polite people are. I don't know if you've ever dealt with like, I don't know, like a French mechanic, but not all Europeans are that nice. Um, we had like a much different experience now. Now it's the, well, this is my job. Therefore, I know everything and forget you, even though you're the customer and without you guys buying your tickets to use my services, uh, I don't have a job. Like no one cares about that anymore. It's like they completely, I, I don't know, everyone needs more Jesus. What can I say? Okay. Hey, man, that. Okay, you study civilizations and their collapse because apparently you're a very dark person. Do you yes. see any parallels between any of these civilizations and ours? Because I sure do. Oh, where do you want to begin? Like, Please. I mean, <laughs> actually, I feel like I could learn a lot more from you because you're far more the history buff. I go way back in time. I sort of go to the uh, ignorance of uh, our place in the cosmos, the sort of like threat of attack, the evidence that's building up that suggests our last major flood, the biblical flood, if you will, was actually caused by asteroids. But if you want to go down the sort of like social lens, I mean, is it, maybe you can correct me on this, but right around the time of like the true collapse of Rome, um, wasn't there an obsession with gender and sexual ideology and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I feel like I've heard about this, whether that was a drunk history or not, I'm not sure. Um, it's actually, but that was definitely an obsession. It's, it's wild that you bring this up. It's something that, you know, pr prior to even, you know, American Christianity or anything like that, civilizations understood that a moral collapse was the beginning of the collapse of the society. The Roman emperors were not exactly uh, born again Christians and they knew, like you're right, they looked around at all the depravity and they knew this is bad. This, this means the end of the empire is coming. And well, I mean, look, Berlin, before Hitler, that piece of trash took over, it was all tranny stuff and whatnot. It's, yep. It always goes this way. And well, here we are, okay? What are we supposed to do about it? Um, I think right now, my biggest fear, if we want to look at it from like a macro perspective, I keep asking the question, what does America do for the rest of the world anymore? Because I love America. I love this place. I spend all day, every day defending it. I live out in rural, real America. And I see that all of my neighbors, we can all sort of like sustain each other. But what do we give the rest of the world anymore? We're not strong because of the DEI stuff, because like we are... I think at this point, kind of like morally bankrupt. I don't know how the Democrats can like sleep at night with what they've done to our social policies and the normalization of like essentially a genocide against America's mentally ill. Like that's what I would call a lot of these crises if you want to put them under one umbrella. Um, so that's what we've basically got in terms of what we contribute culturally right now. Um, I think a lot of other countries are actually making better entertainment than us. We don't really produce anything in terms of like resources. Uh, we're not a threat, um, and pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure pretty soon most of us aren't going to be able to afford to buy stuff from the rest of the world. Things mm. keep going the way that they're going. So it's also like, what does the world need from us anymore? Like, that's my biggest fear right now, because as soon as we actually become redundant, they don't have to do anything for us. And then we have nothing, because we depend on them for everything. Well, oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Good day, mate. We'll talk again <laughs> soon. All right. We have the end of the show coming. Lighten the mood. Next. You know what still gets me? The national anthem. Is that, I don't know, does that make me sound old? Old fashioned? I, I don't know. But I, get, I still love this country so much. And it gets me. And when I see it get other people, that gets me too. U.S. junior hockey team just won it all. And, well, have a dose of patriotism for lighting the mood.
Congratulations, gentlemen. We'll see you tomorrow.